What do zombies, K-pop, and gaming have in common? On today's episode of Everything is Better with Creators, we're speaking with Ned Sherman, Chief of Business Affairs and Legal Officer at Skybound Entertainment. They have helped inform his approach to building incredible value from IP. Today, creators who understand how to build fandoms are operating in a golden era of opportunity. And Ned believes the creator economy has democratized the franchise flywheel perfected by Disney, Apple, and Nintendo. So we spoke to Ned to learn how he's translating creativity into bankability through his experience as a lawyer, investor, and his superpower understanding the power of relationships. So I'm very proud of what you're doing. Smile for 15 seconds out of day and make the world a better place. Welcome to Everything is Better with Creators, brought to you by Whaler. Join us as we dive into the latest trends, news, and strategies shaping the creator economy and learn how it's driving innovation and change. Welcome to our podcast, Ned Sherman. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. You know, when I invited you on here, it gave me a, a, a moment to think about where, where we are based on who, who you are and what you've done. And it kind of, I was a little bit reflective and I thought, you know, we're kind of in this golden era of creativity and opportunity and the creator economy, it's really, it's democratized this idea of this franchise flywheel that we all think about as like being the Disney, Apple, Net Nintendo way of doing things. Um, but, you know, the, the opportunity for creators today, it's, it's, so much better than it ever has been for an individual to build long-term value. And when I was thinking about what we get to talk to you about today, it's like, you've literally, you've done every job that's out there, whether it's monetizing, investing, negotiating deals to support talent. And I can't wait to ask you, because given the fact that we're at this really interesting inflection point, what we, I want to hear from you today is like, you know, how you're viewing the creator economy, what's changed for individuals, for creative individuals in particular with talent, and like what should brands and marketers been, be thinking about this? So let's get into this because I've known you for a while, but I still don't understand how you've done everything you've done. You must be 85 years old, but I, I know you're not. How, you've done everything. I mean, you've advised entertainment companies, you're in gaming, you're in esports, talent digital. Now you work with creators. You're with this incredible company. Before we get into all the brilliant things you're doing now, how the heck did you get into everything? Like, wh where did this come from that you do everything? Well, for, first off, J Jamie, thanks for having me on the show. This, this really is a terrific show. And I know you reach a pretty broad audience, uh, folks. So, so thanks for, for having me on. You know, listen, I grew up in a household with a family that was always entertaining. We were we had people over um, every you know every week, if not multiple times a week. A lot of these events were were last minute, and it wasn't like an LA party where you had a caterer. We were the caterers, we were the bartenders, we were the cooks, we were the waiters, we were the entertainers. Um, and you know, a few things that I learned from from growing up in that environment is the power of relationships, uh, for one, and then two you know, how to stay calm when things go wrong, because things always go wrong and how to focus on, 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 on solutions. So, you know, I think that really instilled in me at a very young age, kind of uh, a desire to be involved in creating experiences. Uh, and then also an ability and a skill set uh, of problem solving that uh, we both know is kind of a you know key to to uh, operating successful entertainment franchises uh, today. Um, because franchises are like a party. Franchises are like a party, and the party always has to keep going, right? But it's such a great metaphor about problems and challenges. And if you can throw a dinner party and you are the caterer. That is that is a bit of insight, but okay. But beyond being the consummate caterer and entertainer, because that that is a, a really apt description. What, what, tell me, dive into you and your background and your job history and all the things you've touched. Yeah, yeah. So, so after college, you know, I I had a very brief career as a teacher, and and, and uh, realized that that was not the path I, I wanted to go down. 
Uh, and I went to law school and, and um, you know, the first kind of seven years of my career was working with major law firms in the U.S. and, and uh, in Asia. I, I worked in, in Tokyo for, for several years. Um, I came to, to L.A. right at the height of the Internet boom and uh, ended up co-founding the digital entertainment department at a major uh, L.A. law firm. And then started my first startup. And, you know, that was really transformational for me, making that transition from being on the service provider side of the equation to running my own company. And it's a company that my wife and I still own today. We have, uh, you know, hired close to 50 different employees over the last 20 years and have worked with uh, the biggest brands in entertainment uh, and and media and it's uh, it's it's really something that uh, that I'm quite proud of and it's a well respected well attended experience because you have such a great perspective on things from legal but from deal making talent and and all of those things but I just, I, di- I didn't even realize that you had like when you say the height of the digital Internet boom. What what year is that in your mind? So I'm, I moved to LA in 1997, and it was it was crazy. You know, I mean, anybody with uh, with a business school degree and a plan on a piece of paper was getting funded in in those days. And you know, it was fascinating. My 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 job at at the firm was all we had an investment fund uh, at, at at the law firm as well. And I was in charge of vetting um, business plans and deciding which companies we'd invest in. I had a stack like, you know, this high on my desk at all times. And it's really interesting. Some of the some of the individuals involved in those early digital entertainment business plans, you know, are the leaders of the companies that are have uh, become the most significant in the space today. And some of the plans, you know. They didn't make it the first time, but uh, they they are, are are were essentially the plans that have come to fruition for for a lot of our our biggest players in the space today. I often have because I was in LA in the digital world at the exact same vintage, uh, and I often tell people that what we're experiencing right now, this creative boom, the creator economy, it feels very reminiscent to those early days of possibility and opportunity and excitement and connecting the dots and some of the same challenges. And there's nothing new in the world, but those are the pre-browser days. Those were the days when uh, Microsoft was in a browser war. Those were, you know, still had dial up and content on the internet was you, those were the days of, uh, of Madeline's mind. Do you, do you remember those kind of, there was no, there was, there were no rules. Nobody knew how to do this stuff. And I still feel like we're, we're kind of in that same space a little bit, but you're right. A lot of the leaders at the time are now running the companies and, and had a lot of resilience. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think that things are cyclical, uh, cyclical and, um, you know, there's, there's still, challenges today in a constant phase of, and I know we're going to get to this later in our conversation about, you know, new innovations and technologies coming in and disrupting the existing businesses. You know, when I started my first uh, uh, company, Digital Media Wire, it was a very simple concept uh, at the time. And you'll, you'll remember this, Jamie, you know, if, if uh, the, the business of entertainment was basically uh, covered by three or four trade publications, and if you were fortunate enough to get your hands on, you know, Variety magazine, the first, when you stepped into the office first thing in the morning, you would get yesterday's news, and uh, and you go through the day and you'd read the articles and you'd be caught up from yesterday. Meanwhile, it's already today. So our concept was, well, couldn't we reach people with an email? with the news of the day in a succinct format. And so we started doing that. And it was, it was you know, a direct-to-consumer model for covering the business of entertainment, digital media news. 
And, um, you know, it taught me a lot of things. One is the power of owning your customer. And second, the power of data and the power of community and what you can do when you have all three of those things. You can monetize in all kinds of different ways. No truer words have ever been spoken. spoken, And I think it's more powerful today than than even it was then. But wow, I, you know, you were you were D to C before that was even a thing. We were absolutely. You've done that. You've had this incredible career, and now you're at Skybound. And I don't know um, who doesn't know the the properties. I don't know if people know that Skybound. If you're not in the in the business, what Skybound does, but definitely know the properties. If you can, can you tell us a little bit about Skybound? And by the way, we're going to have to get into this concept of the wheel of awesome because. It's fantastic, and we often talk about Skybound as being, a, you know, a company for creators. And so we're we're we have a lot of people in the in our entire organization that are so excited to hear this interview. But tell us about Skybound, and then I want to then I'm going to pick your brain on some of the lessons you've learned there. Well, Skybound, you know, it it is truly a multi platform entertainment company. And and well, I'll, I'll get into the wheel of awesome because it is core to to what uh, what we do. Um, but we are reaching fans, creating experiences, and reaching fans uh, through um, about every possible avenue that you could think of. We have a very robust games business uh, where we are a game publisher. We also have an investment in uh, game developer, uh, which which we can talk about later as well. And we're a television company. We have a feature film coming out sh- shortly. We have audio books. Uh, we have podcasts. We have a new music division. Um, we are uh, the creator of toys and merch uh, for the various franchises that we we operate. Uh, and that and that is our wheel of awesome. We have our IP in the middle. Uh, a lot of it uh, emanates from comic books, of which we uh, own or control 150 different IPs. Um, two of those IPs have been very successful. Uh, one that most people will know is The Walking Dead, um, which uh, you know it's just uh, such a thrill to be able to work with an IP like that that is known globally, uh, and we've been able to do some some really cool stuff with it uh and uh, the future is 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 bright in terms of what we'll continue to do with the walking dead and then we have invincible which um we couldn't be more thrilled about um it is an, our, our second big franchise and many more in the works yeah for i mean anybody on the planet that doesn't know that the walking dead has been <laughs> has been such a juggernaut but the invincible they may not know it's still, you know, it's, it's on Amazon. Did I just see you got picked up for a third season? We did. We, we announced uh, seasons two and three. Um, and it's just, I mean, Jamie, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. This is an adult superhero uh, um, series on Amazon. It's gritty. It's, I mean, I have to say when I, when I, when I, when I watched it for the first time, um, I was just, uh, you know, after the first episode, you're just sucked in and, and it's tough and gritty and it's, uh, it has quite a following. So I have a, a bit of a confession. So I'm an OG zombie fan because I worked on uh, Dawn of the Dead in a, a, like a bazillion years ago. And, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of uh, genres that constantly resonates. And there was the, the version in the 70s and there's the 80s that just kind of carried it through. But, you know, the... The whole idea of a comic book fandom taking over the world, obviously Marvel has done this beyond, but but I would argue as a fan here that you guys have taken it in such a unique direction and it maybe it's the Wheel of Awesome. Was the Wheel of Awesome something that you applied to Walking Dead or did the Walking Dead inspire the Wheel of Awesome? Boy, that's a great question. And I would say it's the latter. I think that having a franchise like that that is so beloved and fandom that is so engaged um, allowed us to develop um, the Wheel of Awesome. And, you know, I'll say this, the, the, the Wheel of Awesome isn't for every IP. 
But for one that has such engaged fans, it's really amazing to be able to develop so many experiences and products. I mean, there's been, you may not know, there's there's one of the most successful ever wine launches was a Walking Dead li- uh, line of wines. We right? had, go figure. Um, we, we've had Walking Dead cruises. I mean, they're, 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 this is a franchise that uh, has has reached uh, fans uh, all over the world in so many different ways. And, you know, for people who are looking at this idea of the creator economy as being a fad, Robert Kirkman is a creator. Let's just c- call it that. I mean, George Romero is a creator, but Robert Kirkman is, you know, an incredible creator. And he found a way to launch this IP and build fandom. And it's the, I would argue that the fandom is what obviously has carried the success because if you don't have a fandom, you can't sell a walking dead wine, which I I didn't know, but it's that power of fandom and really understanding what the audience wants and building that support and credibility. That's the, that's the magic that you guys seem to have captured over and over and over again. Um, but you've got big plans at Skybound, right? You're Skybound Japan. Is that that is that yeah, coming? You know, so um, some of the things that we've been doing that I'm super excited about. Um, one, you mentioned Skybound Japan. We we launched um, in Japan in the fall with, um, and and this wasn't a decision that was made made lightly. Uh, our founders uh, and a, a number of us, including myself, I mentioned that I'd, I'd spent time in Japan uh, working there have spent uh, decades working in Japan, understanding um, the, 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 the business relationships there, the companies, the powerful fandom in, in, that, is, that is present there around anime and manga. So when we decided to go in Japan, into Japan, we set up a proper subsidiary, Skybound Japan KK. We have um, a Japanese employee on the ground. We'll be expanding that team over time. And we also entered into um, a partnership with a consortium of Japanese entertainment companies, the top companies in entertainment in Japan. And you're going to be hearing a lot about what we're doing uh, over, over in, in Japan. There, there are projects that I can't talk about right now, but they are in the works and are coming straight out of that, that relationship in, in Japan. And do you think, I, I don't know, fandom in Japan is seems so intense and so beyond what we would imagine is here. I mean, that that's an, when you're a fan in Japan, you're really a hardcore fan. Are you seeing differences in fandom in APAC versus the U S or are there lessons learned from how those fans learn about content or participate in content? You know, it feels to me like, um, the North American market is always kind of a step behind Asia. And, and I mean that in a very respectful way for Asia and its, and its, its, its companies and its, and its fans. Um, There has been a level of engagement and a use of digital tools and technology and fan clubs and experiences there that uh, I'm starting to see adopted here in the U.S. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, this goes back to um, my experience. You mentioned I was in ta- talent management. Um, Ten years ago, I, I, I was the uh, global talent manager for a K-pop artist before K-pop was really the thing it is today. Um, our artist had 26, even at that time, 26 fan clubs all over the world. and. Um, one of the things that we did with with uh, with him is we did a 13 city fan meet tour and fan meets, uh, which are starting to kind of get popular here now, are, are really kind of a mix between a variety show and a concert. And, you know, we would tour um, Asia and meet the fans. He would invite fans up to the stage. You know, I mean, how often do you see that with like a major pop star, you know? And and really engage with with fans on a level that was quite intimate. And I think that our company's entertainers here are starting to take some of those uh, those lessons. And there's kind of less of a separation between artist and fan uh, than as as there was uh, in the past. 
that you can unpack that in so many different ways. But I, I, I think one of the benefits or one of the lessons that we are seeing from the work that we're doing at Whaler with, with brands and with creators is that what creators or artists know better than anyone else is their audience, their fandom. And they cater to that in a way that is, it's almost like a, they've got a sixth sense because you don't even know, there's no research that can tell you what a fandom is going to want. They just intuit it and then can develop the content and the ideas and the experiences better than anyone else. And yet there's, there's so many different ways that you can monetize that, uh, especially if you're getting really smart about it. So you're sitting on both sides. You've got the talent side and then the monetization side. Could you t- talk a little bit about that? Would love to. Um, you know, we've been doing Kickstarters for, for quite a while now, Pro- probably one of the more successful companies in terms of working with creators and launching uh, successful Kickstarters. For example, we did a campaign for Trial by Trolley that generated uh, over 3.5 million in 30 days. It was backed by 55,000 55, backers uh, around the world. Uh, you know, we've been able to really cultivate the combination of fan and community g- engagement, gamification, word of mouth marketing, awareness marketing. It's it's really you know, kind of core to the Skybound DNA, which is to allow our fans greater access to the IP that we're creating and to involve them. And and this is something that we're in the process of doing with our Skybound Insider program to be able to involve them more in the decisions that are being made in terms of how we uh, how we grow IP and franchising. It's you know Skybound opening up the tent and saying. We're going to allow fans, everyday people, to become owners of our company. We want to work with you. And um, it's been an, just an incredible experience. Okay, so I'm going to ask questions like I'm a five-year-old because I, I'm, I'm fascinated and I also want to make sure that I'm understanding this so I can figure out how to go do this on my own. Second of all, what is the difference between just sell, you're, are you selling stock in Skybound or are you selling stock in a particular property or franchise and what are the mechanics of that? That, that, That's a great question. And and I should also be clear to distinguish between what we're doing here and what we do with a Kickstarter too. Yeah, that was my next question. Yep. So with a Kickstarter, you get benefits, but you don't get any real ownership in the, the products you're supporting, the services, the company, right? It's 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 really a way for fans to engage and to get get benefits based on on funds that they put in. A reg, reg A financing is we're selling shares of stock. In our case, it's units in our operating company, at our head level company, and you're becoming an owner at a share price, just like every other owner in the company. And um, it's uh, when when the company goes up in value, and hopefully someday when our company has a an exit, whether it's an IPO or we're acquired by another company. Folks will be able to cash in their shares that they purchased in our Reg A, hopefully for for a profit someday. And so, is this like I guess like the Green Bay Packers? That I, I I believe the Green Bay Packers did something similar. Yeah, you can buy. You don't really have voting rights. You you get something that you own, so that you're. It's an ultimate sign of fandom. It'll be interesting to see where we we are um, very actively. Um, in, um, working on ways that we will now engage on a regular basis with those 5,000 investors who we have so that it goes beyond just, you know, a shareholders meeting and, uh, you know, keeping folks posted on everything that we're doing and giving them special opportunities uh, to uh, engage with us in our IP throughout the year. Well, that is the new way of managing your fandom, right? It used to be, it was behind the the sort of, Velvet Curtain, The Wizard of Oz, don't see what's going on behind here. And you guys have flipped that and said, come on in under the tent. Those are your words. We're opening up the tent. That's right, Jamie. It's an open tent. And 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 you know, we're just really excited about it. We we think that fantastic things can happen when you're transparent with your fans and 
some of our fans know RP yeah. as well or better than people in the company. And, you know, to bring them into the tent and hear what their ideas are, you know, is something that we think could be very exciting. So we are working on ways to uh, foster that even more. I mean, good and bad, don't mess with fans. And if you, you know, uh, that the whole Dungeons and Dragons debacle when that happened recently where they ch- they were going to change the the fee structure and the licensing and all of that, that was a frightening example of don't mess with your fan base. Fans can be very, very, very powerful. And, uh, you know, they they can be a force uh, for uh, for good. And, 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 you know, certainly to your point, there can be you know, negative ramifications that, that come out of out of uh, disappointing fans. <laughs> Well, I mean, on on many levels, and I want to cover off on this and then go on to this whole idea of fans, but the idea for a creator, it obviously sounds like this is not an easy thing. A reggae is not an easy thing to execute, but is it something that creators who are starting to build up, a, a, like what's the threshold? What What would make this something that is a legit opportunity or something, a consideration for a creator? The reggae is quite a commitment. Um, it is designed more for um, for operating companies than just for a for a creator. And not that there are some creators certainly that have have operating companies and infrastructure and so forth and are grow, growing growing in that direction that this could be a fit for. Um, but just to give you a sense, the Reg A allows for raising up to seventy five million dollars. Some people using the reggae platform or you as using it as a stepping stone towards doing an IPO. Um, there are some other um, uh, exemptions to, um, to financing that would allow for project-based financing that are similar to the reggae. And you'll see some of the platforms like Republic that do have uh, creator projects that are, are on, the plat- on their platform. Um, that allow for raising uh, funds uh, from from retail investors. Um, I do think that you know crowdfunding, um, whether it's through a Kickstarter or a Patreon, just you know going back to what we talked about earlier, the direct to consumer engagement is extremely powerful and is a great way for creators to get off the ground, build their brands, and scale. Well, that's one of the big challenges that we are trying to help out the creators that we represent navigate because it's, you've got to try to find ways to have passive income so that it's not all based on, you know, you have to make money while you sleep and it's very time consuming and mentally taxing to be a creator. So there seems to have been an explosion over the last couple of years. There's always some new you know, they range from schemes to strategies for how creators can make money. Uh, put your legal hat on for a minute. How are you advising people who are creators to build their businesses in a way that's sustainable and more long term? It's a great question, and and I'll kind of go back to some of the work I did prior to to coming to um, to Skybound, but it's relevant too to the way that we work with creators, and that is. Um, you know, creators of all types ought to really be thinking about uh, ownership and uh, participation uh, in the brands that they promote, that they help to create, help to scale. That um, and I'll, I'll I'll give you an example of a, a project that I worked on previously, representing one of the top Twitch sc- uh, streamers. Who is also an esports um, player and star, and when he was asked to renew his deal with the team, um, we insisted upon that deal including ownership in the team, and uh, were successful in in building into his deal ownership, and he's now a team owner. And I think you know those kinds of things uh, previously were not really thought of too much, like you know uh, it was kind of assumed that that uh, creators get paid but they don't get equity. I think that uh, kind of flipping that around and thinking about what, what value you're bringing as a creator, which, which can really help to scale and grow, grow companies and brands uh, and getting a piece of that action long-term. I love that phrase. I'm going to have that made to a bumper sticker. Um, but you know, we're starting to see much more discussion about creators on the cap table and 
tapping into their knowledge in the development of products, et cetera. And I think it's it's a super exciting time. I can't believe we didn't talk. You, you've, your range of expertise is so broad. Gaming is obviously an area near and dear to your heart. You're really new. Um, and I don't know how you do this, but in your spare time that you don't seem to have, you also have uh, a partnership and goal ventures. What, what are you doing there and how does that allow you to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, in gaming um, and to translate into that world? So I've, I've been angel investing for, for uh, you know, half a dozen years or more and uh you know for, formalized goal, goal ventures uh, a couple of couple of years ago and it's it's just been super exciting we have a, a a venture capital fund that invests in companies in the games ecosystem and more broadly in digital media um i what i love about the game industry and the opportunities there is you know games are really becoming a platform for content creation for fan engagement for user generated content it's no longer just a game <laughs> it's a they're, they're becoming platforms and you know you see this with Fortnite and Ro- Roblox but when when you're you know in my investor chair and you're seeing all the interesting business plans coming through the the door this is a model that's starting to be prevalent in pretty much you know, every game studio that we're seeing, they're not just creating a game, they're creating a platform that can live and breathe and really engage users and fans in content development. And, you know, the successful ones are then able to bring in the big name brands and uh, entertainment companies that want to be on the platform because of the community element there. So are you thinking, is this mobile? Is this platform? Is this it's all of it. It's all of it. And, and, I, and I think that's where we're headed to. That's a really interesting you know, part of it, Jamie, is that you know, the, 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 the device um, and the, 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 the distribution mode is less important today. Most of the games that are coming out today are multi-platform. Experience, of course, might be quite a little bit different on each, on each uh, device, but um, you know, you're able to engage with the same identity you know on multiple multiple platforms um and you're starting to see you know connectivity with some of the biggest names in the in the gaming and tech space that are just going to broaden that uh out over multiple companies and multiple uh multiple brands i heard recently and this was i i thought i knew as much as one could know on a daily basis about tiktok but i just learned how massive the TikTok content, I guess, following is for games. Everyone thinks about it as for Twitch, but actually TikTok is another juggernaut in terms of content and creators sharing their content and their, you know, um, their gameplay on Twitch, on TikTok, as well as Twitch. It's just a massive opportunity. And then you've got, you know, the last of us and all of these things is so gaming. Do you think it's, it's moved away from the stereotype of, you know, guy loner in his basement in his chair in his mom's basement. I think of games as the center of the entertainment industry today. Oh, that's a bold statement. I, yeah. And I don't say that lightly because, you know, there's, you know, we both have, have teen kids, Jamie and, and, you know, the the pop culture references that I hear in my house with my friends uh, tend to be around gaming brands, concepts, characters, stories. Um, it is the center of the universe for um, a lot of a, a, a lot of the youth today, and I think that's just going to grow and grow and create so many opportunities uh, for the entertainment industry. So, in the same way that comic books were the center of this IP engine it's now it's now gaming officially i think it's been like that for a while but i think is mainstream well you know and and, and you know with business folks here when you think about it from a from the business standpoint games monetize you know in such a big way and um and and that that's led you know led to this this uh positioning i think that is you know so dominant now 
if you want to make money in today's entertainment ecosystem, you'd better have a game strategy. That is a strong, I love that statement. I think that's awesome. Um, do you think, do you think that the Microsoft, uh, do you think they're listening to you and, and having a game strategy <laughs> and they're all their acquisitions that you must be whispering in their ear there? Listen, I think, I think Microsoft is leaps and bounds ahead, you know, in terms of, of, of the visioning and, and, you know, be yet to be seen kind of what the, what this, uh, consolidation of companies is going to, you know, turn out to, to be, but when you start linking together, um, you know, game studios, game platforms, companies that own, you know, AI solutions and software and have the reach that they have. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious to me that what they're building here is going to be a content creation juggernaut and something that, uh, can really engage with fans and community everywhere. Yeah. I, I could not agree more. I love it. I think it's, it's so exciting. I think, and I love the goal is, is involved in this direction. Um, I know you have to get back to lawyering, investing, managing IP traveling around the world. So final segment here, we do something called sink, sail, swim. And I know you're a huge sailor. So this was not designed just for you, but at Whaler, we have this whale nautical motif. So tell me something that you think is uh, sinking that's not working in the world of creators or the entertainment business today. Um, in, the, in the entertainment business today, um... I think that thinking that you need to be everywhere all at once, and I think that's a common misconception and can lead to a lot of kind of sort of there, but uh, people are, are quick to, you know, consumers and fans are quick to uh, see the lack of commitment and it's uh, better to do a few things really well. So don't have a fake gaming strategy. Don't have a fake gaming strategy. Don't have a fake TikTok strategy. You know, let's focus on doing one thing well and move to the move to the next. Like moving along the wheel of awesome. Okay, sailing, and I and I I, I figured this was a perfect one for you. What's what's on the rise? Like what's what do you see as the next thing? What is just about to to hit? Um, well, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about the creator ecosystem because I know a lot of your your audience is interested in this. I think that creator brands and labels and products are something that's super exciting. I look at like what Mr. Beast has been able to do, and you know, a lot of 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 uh, less known creators who have an audience that trust them, and uh, they're able to to influence with their uh, with their decisions and. I think it's a huge, huge opportunity for bigger brands to engage with those creators and to build offshoots and new brands and labels and so forth, new businesses. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, now Mr. Beast is so mainstream. I can't, I, I can't imagine that we would have said that 18 months ago. It'll be fascinating to see who the next wave of Mr. Beasts are uh, and 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 going forward. But I agree. I, you did say something I hadn't heard. It's such an obvious, but creator brands, yeah, we hear all the time, but creator labels. What do you mean by a creator label? I, I love that idea, and I unpack that for me. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know, you know, if I'm really distinguishing too much, but I guess creator label, I'm thinking about more where your work, a creator is working with a recognized brand as their partner, but they're creating their own label as part of that brand's offerings. And it's really a great way, I believe, for brands and, and creators who don't have the infrastructure uh, to get businesses off the ground. Because a lot, of, a lot of times these creators, as successful as they are on the platforms that they're on, they haven't operated a clothing business before. <laughs> they don't have warehouses and distribution. And, you know, so to be able to uh, become a label for uh, an existing uh, brand and company, I think, is an interesting concept. You mean like Jordan and Nike, like that kind yeah. of vision? You know, that might have worked. That might have worked. 
That, that, that might have been a good strategy. No, I, 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 I like that, but I like when you say the creator label and, and the idea that I know there's a lot of creators and we're seeing it. They're building their own products, but the infrastructure and the factories and all of those components to it, that's, that's not in their core competency. Um, and the brands working with creators that, you know, that, that really is, uh, as I can't say that enough, that's the smartest strategy a brand could have. Uh, and we're seeing creators as creative directors uh, as a as a component because they are experts in their area and they know their fans better than anybody just to kind of go back to that. But and and then, I'll, I'll add one other thing to it. And I think a creator within a creator label structure, you're also empowering the creator to identify up and coming creators that might become part of that label. It's a little bit of a music concept, but applying it in the in the you know consumer product brand world. You see that in music, yeah, a lot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, you're pulling on, you know, another one of your capabilities that you just add to this uh, suitcase full of skills. Uh, final, final question. What's working? What's swimming? What's what's going well? But more importantly, why is it going well in the creator economy right now? I think that we're starting to see the use of data, the direct to consumer owning the consumer relationship. Um, brands having fun with it too. Um, and, and, and I think that just attracts more interest and engagement when that, when it doesn't feel like it's, it's being pushed or, 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 you know, and it, and it really is kind of more natural. Uh, so I think, yeah, take, taking the time to really understand your customers and create content and experiences and engagement that, uh, is reflective of who you are as a brand and who your customers are. Um, Going back to that, nobody knows their fans better than a creator, right? Absolutely. They just they just know them. They know it. They may not even be able to articulate it. Just it's in their it's their DNA. Um, Ned, this has been an incredible experience. I didn't realize how fast the time went. I've learned so much. I really appreciate you sharing. Um, if somebody wants to uh, do a reg A, or if they want to learn about things? Is there a, a, a place they should go to learn more about Ned Sherman? Should they go to digital entertainment? Like where can they find out more yeah, about Ned? I think LinkedIn's probably the best. Uh, Ned Sherman, you know, on, on LinkedIn and and uh, feel free to ping me and uh, would love to hear from folks. Thank you so much. Well, go out there and go do great things. Thanks, Jamie. I really enjoyed it. Everything is Better with Creators is honored to be part of the Adweek Podcast Network and the Acast Creator Network. And we're so grateful for your support. So if you enjoyed the show, please hit that subscribe button. And if you have a moment, we'd really appreciate a rating and a review. To keep up with all things Whaler and the latest in the creator economy, check us out at whaler.com and follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I'm Jamie Goodfriend, signing off for now. We'll catch you next time with another episode of Everything is Better with Creators, powered by Whaler. Thanks so much for tuning in.